here at Forest Oaks Lutheran Church in your personal prayers at home, doesn't anybody feel uncomfortable right now? The congregation may be seated. You know what it reminds me of? The very first sermon I ever preached. There I was, a young student in the seminary, my very first year at the sem, and I came home for summer vacation, and my pastor, he told me, hey, you know, how would you like to preach in the pulpit this summer? And, oh, I was eager, and I was excited. I'd been at the seminary. I had a college education. I'd studied the Bible for years and years. Yes, I'm ready to go. I've got a, a great thing to tell the people. I want to get up and tell them that God loves them, that he forgives them, that he's prepared this beautiful, wonderful place for them to be in paradise and in heaven. Yes, I want to preach the word of God. I want to stand tall in the pulpit in God's house on Sunday morning and my pastor said great I'm taking that Sunday off during that week I worked on my very first sermon I sat and I wrote and I thought and I pondered and I studied and I created this sermon really right I wrote my very first sermon on Abraham in the Old Testament how God called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees and how he calls each and every one of us to walk that straight and narrow way and I thought it was great. I thought I was brilliant. No other preacher had ever crafted a sermon as good as mine. Surely Billy Graham would call me up and ask me for advice and wisdom and I was so very excited I couldn't wait. Sunday morning came and we got into the service and the people were singing the hymns and praying the prayers and I was on top of the world. I wasn't nervous. I wasn't scared. I wasn't worried at all. I was energized to preach the word of God. And then we sang the sermon hymn. And it dawned on me when these people quit singing, I'm going to have to get up and preach. And I was filled with terror because word had gotten out into the community and anybody who had ever known me since the day I was born, aunts and uncles, cousins, friends, neighbors, fellow workers, everybody had showed up to hear Glenn Fisher preach his very first sermon. The young guy at the seminary is going to give us the word of God and the church was packed from wall to wall, door to door, and I sat there and I froze. And I distinctly remember, I can still picture it in my mind, sitting there on the altar in the pastor's chair with the pulpit. We had a pulpit kind of like this one. You had to climb the little stairs to get up in it. And I was sitting there, and I honestly thought to myself, you know what? If I don't preach, nobody will notice. <laughs> oh, really? Kind of like today. I dare say that when we didn't follow the liturgy, the program, if you will, it just seemed a little odd. I even noticed during the sermon hymn, everybody kind of getting comfortable, finding your spot, kind of wallering down for that 20, 30 minute nap, depending on how long the preacher was going to preach, right? And the whole offering plate fiasco was not part of the program. <laughs> You know, that was just another Sunday at Forest Oaks, right? What does a preacher do if he does not preach? You know, I thought it was really, I don't know, I, I hate to use the word ironic, but we're on Hebrews chapter 13 now. We read all about angels last week. We preached about angels, talked about angels, and today we finish the book of Hebrews. And the closing words, all right, the closing words are these. This is Hebrew chapter 13, verse 17. Obey your leaders. Obey your leaders, says the Apostle Paul. Now, he's not talking about the governor of Florida or the mayor of Brooksville or the president of our country. He's not talking about someone who is in a political office. He is talking about pastors within the church, all right? So another way to translate this, obey your pastors and submit to their authority. What kind of authority do I have here at Forest Oaks Lutheran Church? What kind of power, what kind of authority does a pastor have within the church? I have the power to forgive, 
and I have the power to withhold forgiveness. Did you know that? It's called the Office of the Keys. Break open your catechism when you get home tonight and look up the Office of the Keys and you'll see the awesome responsibility that I have as a Lutheran pastor. Now how in the world did I get this kind of authority? I got it from you. You might remember it's been, you know, I've been here almost 16 years. Can you believe that? I've been here almost 16 years. If I had been born the day I came here, I would almost be ready to get my driver's license right now. You know, and time seems like it's just flown by. I have to sit and think, 16 years, really? 16 years, really? 16 years, wow, you know? Time flies when you're having fun. But if you were here the day I was installed as pastor, the church receives the authority from God. The church then takes this God-given authority and vests it into the pastor via the call. That's the reason whenever I do the confession and absolution, I say what? As the called and ordained servant of the word, as the called and ordained servant of the word. This, my friends, is the reason that it's called the office of the public ministry, okay? The office of the public ministry. I do not baptize little babies. Did you know that? The church baptizes little babies. But it would get the baby pretty wet if every single individual from the congregation came forward to the baptismal font and sprinkled the baby with water. We would need gallons upon gallons upon gallons of water, wouldn't we? And so therefore, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, let all things be done decently and in good order. So rather than everybody coming up with a cup full of water, you ask me to do it. And I, on behalf of the congregation, baptize a little baby. And I've got to say that that's the sweetest little baby. That is, I was watching her before church. What a sweet, sweet little baby. You can tell that baby is well-loved. She's always happy. And unlike some people in the congregation, she doesn't sleep through the sermon. <laughs> the office of the public ministry. Likewise, when I pronounce the absolution, that is via the church, via the church, by the authority of the call. Likewise, when I consecrate the elements for communion, the bread and the wine, which become the body and blood of Jesus Christ, I don't do that. You do that through me, through me, hence the called and ordained servant of the word. Listen to what Paul says, obey your leaders a.k.a. obey your pastor, and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give account. When you die, when you die, you're going to stand before God. And when you stand before God, the great fear that everybody has when they stand before God, oh, he's going to ask me this, he's going to ask me that, he's going to ask me all kinds of questions, and I hope I know the answers, and I hope I know the right answers, and I hope that he lets me into heaven. That, my friends, is a misunderstanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I tell you what you do in your devotion today. You know, every week I try and give you a little biblical nugget to go home and read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest. Now, you all should know John 3.16 by heart, Correct? Gospel in a nutshell. We could all recite it now. Here's what I want you to do. Read John 3, chapter 3, verses 16, 17, and 18. John 3, 16, 17, and 18. That is the clearest explanation of the gospel in the entire Word of God. It's the clearest and the shortest. Those who believe in Christ as their Lord and Savior do not come into condemnation, says Jesus Christ himself. This isn't a disciple that says these words. It's not an Old Testament prophet that says these words. Christ himself says these words. 
So therefore, when you stand before God, the only thing that he will say to you, forgiven, forgiven. He's not going to dig up all those past sins that you have committed during your life. He's not going to open that great big book and find page after page of transgression of things that have offended him during your life. If you have gone to God in heartfelt prayer and confession, if you have repented of those sins, God, I offer you the sins that I have committed in thought, word, and deed. God takes those sins and he totally and completely obliterates them. How many times have I said here in the house of God, quoted the word of God itself. He will cast them as far as the east is from the west and he will remember them no more. That's what you get when you stand before God. With me, it's going to be a little bit different. Let me read again the word of God. Let me read again this verse, okay? Okay. This applies to all pastors, all priests, all preachers. Listen to this word of God. They keep watch over your soul as men who must give account. Did you know that? That when I stand before God on the judgment day, when I die and I'm standing before God, he's going to ask me a couple of questions. How did you do down there at Forest Oaks Lutheran Church? Why did you preach so long? Why did you have those long sermons that the people had to endure Sunday after Sunday? God love them and God bless them because they heard it one Sunday and then they came back and heard it again. They keep watch over your soul. I wasted a lot of cardboard this week. You might know that when I write my sermons out, (laughs) being cheap, okay, being both German and Scottish, I save all these little cardboard boxes, right? Because they make great cards for sermon preparation, right? You can flip them over, cut them up, and you end up with these really great cards and people, they want to throw them away. And I say, no, that's sermon material. And I have boxes and boxes of boxes, right? And this week, I honestly thought that today's sermon would be really easy to preach because after all I'm going to preach about being a preacher I'm going to preach about being a pastor in the church and you know I do that every day and so this ought to be really simple and really easy and then I sat down and started to write my outline for today and I discovered you know it's not as easy as it seems because what do I really want to share with the congregation about who I am and what I do. See, here's the struggle. You're never not a pastor when you're a pastor. There's never a given point in time to where you are not a pastor within the church. You don't clock out and go home. You are a pastor 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Probably one of the most common questions I get in regard to being a pastor. What's your biggest job? What do you do the most? And I always tell people you're either preaching or you're getting ready to preach. Because sermon preparation, you can't just sit down and do that in an hour. You can't just come in at nine o'clock and clock in and say, okay, today I will create a sermon, and by the end of the day it will be done. You take that Word of God, and you read that Word of God, and you compare that Word of God to the Word of God. Scripture always interprets Scripture, all right? And you dwell upon that all the time, all the time. When I'm out here mowing the grass, okay, that's my greatest sermon prep time. You'll notice that I mowed everything this past week, so I had a lot of time to prepare because I had a lot on my mind. (laughs) 
what would I tell the people? I mentioned before, I, I hesitate to use the word irony because I want to say that it's a connection with the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit knew that I would be preaching on Hebrews 13, 17, and, and did you hear about the pastoral struggles in the Old Testament lesson, the Epistle lesson, and the Gospel lesson? John the Baptist preached a sermon to Herod that Herod didn't like, and he ended up losing his head for it. What kind of an individual would, would request a human head on a platter? That's the world John the Baptist was preaching in. We read the news, we watch the TV, we see all the reports out there of the chaos, the mayhem, the hatred, the anger, the discord, and we say, you know what, our world is going to pot, it's falling apart, we've never had a world this chaotic before. Consider today's gospel lesson where the leader of the Jewish people beheaded the principal preacher for preaching the truth. That, my friends is the primary responsibility of any Christian pastor. A Christian pastor should never expect to be popular. A Christian pastor should never expect that everybody's going to love him. A Christian pastor should never expect that everybody will say, okay, Because a Christian pastor is charged by God to preach the truth of God. And sometimes that's not very popular. Sometimes that's not very well received. But who do I as a Christian pastor give account to? Do I go to the church council? No. Do I go to the elders of our church? No. Do I visit the finance committee and say, don't stop payment on my check? Which they've never done, okay? They don't go home and say, they're not paying the pastor. They pay me well, all right? Who does the pastor give account to? The apostle Paul says, if I run for men, then I run in vain. Because ultimately, I'm not going to stand before the church council or the elders of the church or the finance committee or, or any committee here within the church. But before God himself, my job, my responsibility. See, I even, I even hesitate to call it a job because I've had jobs before and you go to work and you work and you come home and you don't worry about it, Right? You clock in, you clock out, you get your check, and then, you know, in your time off, you do what you want to do. I'm not complaining. This is part of the struggle that I had in writing this message. I don't want you to think that I'm complaining. I love what I do. I love what I do. I can't stop doing what I do. I love what I do. But I can't ever get away from it. At any point in time, at any day during the week, at any hour during the day, did I just turn my microphone off? No, I'm good. Because being a pastor isn't what I do, it's who I am, all right? And so therefore, when people ask me, what do you do? I'm a pastor, and I preach, and I teach, and I administer the sacraments, and I pronounce the absolution, and I try to comfort the disturbed and disturb the comfortable. That's the role of a pastor. I thought to myself, what could I say to the people of God here within the house of God? And I came up with a list, all right? I came up with a list, and I decided that I would share. See, we've already made two cards, all right? We've made it through two cards, so we're almost done came up with a list. What should you expect from your pastor? If the holy author Paul, under inspiration, says, you know, submit to their authorities, they act as someone who is watching over your soul, as someone who must give an account. 
what should you expect? And I wrote up these expectations. You should not expect your pastor to have an organized office. I didn't write that down, but I just threw it in there, okay? You should not expect your pastor to be perfect. Read through the Old Testament, read through the New Testament, read through the lives of the apostles and the disciples, and you'll discover that they're just human men, okay? Human men picked by God. I find it ironic that time and time and time again, whenever God calls somebody to get into his ministry, to do his work, he doesn't go to the seminary. He doesn't see who has straight A's. He doesn't see who lives a life of holiness. No, he finds a murderer like Moses who's hiding out in the desert. He finds a coward like Gideon who squatted down in the wine press. He finds a murderer like the Apostle Paul who is on a murderous mission heading to Damascus to seek to destroy the Christian church. He finds men who have calloused hands and dirt under their fingernails like Peter and James and John. Individuals who are not perfect, so that God's perfection can be proclaimed in them. Don't expect your pastor to be perfect, but you should expect him to be honest. You should always expect your pastor to be honest. And sometimes that honesty can be a little biting, okay? If an individual comes to me and tells me about some ungodly thing that they're doing and they do not come in repentance, okay, they do not come in confession, but rather they come and they brag about this thing. It is my job to be honest with them and to say, you know what, what you're doing is wrong. It is ungodly. It is against God's will. Stop it. I think one of these days I'm going to have a sermon to where I just say that. You know, when John the Baptist rolls around again, John the Baptist Sunday, the third Sunday in Advent, stop it! Amen. You know, we're not done. Okay, we're not done. You should expect your pastor to keep confidences. I thought about that during the week when I was on the mower, and it occurred to me that as a pastor, I am a great keeper of secrets. Now, I don't want you to get the impression that people are lining up at my door every day telling me some deep, dark sin, okay? But occasionally, people do come and talk to me, and they tell me something that they've never told anybody else in their whole life. And I keep that confidential. I don't come to church on Sunday and say, guess what I just heard? <laughs> Part of my job, part of my vow, part of my commitment, if you come to me and tell me something, I keep it between you and me and God. You should always expect your pastor to keep confidences. You should expect him to faithfully preach and teach the whole word of God. If you find a Christian pastor who in God's house or any day during the week twists or bends or manipulates the word of God, well, what I think it really means is this. No, no, no. That individual will be called to account before God himself, and God will ask him, why did you mislead my people? Why didn't you tell them the truth? Why didn't you keep their feet on that narrow way? I think I've told you before about the, uh, well, let's see, what time is it? No, we got time. We got time. Really briefly, I told you before about the time I met with the Christian, a Lutheran pastor, a Lutheran pastor, not a Missouri Synod pastor, but a Lutheran pastor, and we're talking, we're dialoguing, and this Lutheran pastor tells me, well, you know what? All people are going to go to heaven as long as they're good, as long as they're sincere, as long as they're nice and try and get along with everybody. And I said, really? You really believe that? You're not just like laying a trap or playing the devil's advocate. And he said, no, I really and truly believe this, that as long as you're a good person, God will let you into his heaven. And I said, you're sending people to hell. You're misrepresenting the gospel of Jesus Christ. What kind of a sick, twisted, demented God would cause his son to suffer that kind of pain and humiliation and suffering if there was another way? You should be ashamed of yourself, is what I told that pastor. 
you will have to give account to God as to why you corrupted his message. You should always expect your pastor to faithfully preach and teach the whole word of God. You should expect your pastor to comfort you and to make you uncomfortable. Do you have guilt in your life? Do you have shame? Do you have regret over something you did or said? Come to God in heartfelt confession, confess that sin honestly and sincerely, and then rejoice in the forgiveness of God. That's one of the hardest jobs I have, is to convince people that God loves them and God forgives them. It's really easy to make people feel guilty. Believe me, I grew up with a Lutheran mother. I know how to make people feel guilty. But it's incredibly difficult to make them feel forgiven. Friends, rejoice in the forgiveness of God. That's comfort. But if you're doing something ungodly, if you're justifying your sin, if you're saying, you know what, it really doesn't matter. It matters to God. That's why he put his son on the cross. If you're justifying your sin, giving it an excuse, whatever it may be, I'm not going to go into detail, ah, using God's name in vain, there, there's an easy one, then feel uncomfortable. In the words of John the Baptist, repent. Do you know that's the very first sermon that Jesus preached? Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. And from that day on, says the Bible, Jesus began to preach, saying, repent. The very first sermon that Jesus preached, the very first word out of his mouth in his very first sermon, repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. You should expect your pastor to edify and not entertain. I think that's a great danger that we as Christians fall into in the Christian church today. We, we, we have this feeling, this, this mentality that somehow the worship service should be entertaining and we should sing songs that are exciting and we should all jump up and down and it should be like a Broadway musical and a show. No, it shouldn't. Worship is worship of God. And so when we come into this holy place, we seek to, to, to feed and nourish our soul and our spirit. The pastor should edify not entertain. Now, you and I both know, you know, I, I'm a big one to tell stories. I might tell a, what I consider to be a funny joke, you know, like I used to work at a blanket factory and then it folded, right? Ha, ha. Okay, I thought it was funny. You know, you know case in point, right? But as long as it leads to edification, growth in the spirit, what should a pastor expect of his congregation. I made a whole long list of what you can expect of me. What can I expect from you? Not blind obedience. Not blind obedience. That would be misusing this word of God. If I told the people, you know what, I am the Lutheran pastor of Forest Oaks Lutheran Church, the called and ordained servant of the word, and I deserve a brand new Cadillac with air conditioning and plush leather seats, and the congregation by my command will buy me said car. The congregation should rise up and say, too bad, go buy your own car. Which, by the way, I don't want a new car, okay? I really, really like my car. I really do. Me and my car get along well together. The pastor should never expect blind obedience from his congregation. What he should expect is prayerful encouragement, prayerful support, prayerful understanding that if something's going on within the church that maybe you don't agree with, rather than doing the bad thing, putting the worst construction on it, how about putting 
the best construction on it, saying, you know what? It's like my sister says, there's three sides to every story, your side, my side, and the truth. Put the best construction on everything. What should a pastor expect of his congregants? Love, support, encouragement, guidance, and prayer. Pray for me, my friends, that when my time comes to stand before God, I may give a good account of the work that I have done. Friends and fellow Christians, with that I say, Amen. The congregation will now rise.